Okay, so people, I think we shall start. Ten minutes after five, so. Okay. So, I would like to welcome you all to the SLE 2023 Roundtable on the Study of Language Change in the 21st Century, Theories and Tools. I'm Nicolas Davidas, Chair of the Local Organizing Committee of SLE 2023, Associate Professor of Diachronic Linguistics at the University of Athens, member of the Executive Committee of SLE, and I will act here as the moderator of the round table. I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart our invited speakers for accepting our invitation and for preparing a round table that favors dialogue and exchange of views regarding the central question and challenge of studying language change after the development of new theoretical perspectives and after the establishment of new tools and new methodologies. We are honored that Professor Michela Tenamo, Professor Jonathan Kampfeber, Professor Miriam Fried are going to offer us their insights and their expertise in different levels of linguistic analysis and within different theoretical perspectives. So it will be extremely interesting uh, to learn more on how the study of language change concerns different levels of linguistic analysis, different theories, and different perspectives. Michele Tenamo is Professor of Linguistics and Chair of General Linguistics at the School of Modern Languages, Department of Arts and Humanities, University of, of Naples, Federico II, uh, and her main research interests include transitivity and argument structure from a typological, synchronic, and dichronic perspective, such as reflexives, uh, study of reflexives, passives, impersonal, uh, voice phenomena in general. Uh, she, she also uh, works on the synchronic and diachronic aspects of the lexicon syntax interface, such as split in, in transitivity in Talo Romance, case marking and alignment variations and changes, and the causative in transitive alternations in Italian and early Italian vernaculars, and also on the complex predicate, causative and perception constructions, uh, the relationship between auxiliaries and series. Um, she further works on the morphosyntax of the Italian dialects, for instance, verbal periphrases, auxiliary selection, passives, reflexive constructions, valency patterns. She has participated in many international projects as advisor and uh, contrib contributor. For example, she was a member of the Scientific Advisory uh, Board of the ERC Consolidator Grant for the Project Heritage Italo Romance Varieties in America in contact with other Italo Romance varieties and with English. She was a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Project's uh, Splitting and Clustering Grammatical Information. She was consultant to the AHRC funded project existential cons constructions and investigation into the intolerant romance dialects. Jonathan Kalpeper is professor of linguistics at the Lancaster University and the head of the Department of English and English Language, and his research interests include pragmatics, English language, especially historical aspects, and stylistics. Within pragmatics, he is particularly interested in interperson interpersonal pragmatics and politeness in politeness. Historical pragmatics brings together pragmatics with its interest in historical linguistics, the history of English in particular. Within English language, he is particularly working on early modern English. Within stylistics, he particularly investigates cognitive stylistics, plays, and Shakespeare. Methodologically, uh, he has particular interest in corpus-based methods. Among other research projects, he has continually published in the area of English historical linguistics, 
often with a historical pragmatics focus and often underpinned by corporate methods. With grants from the British Academy and the AHRB, he has collaborated with uh, Maria Quito in the construction of a highly specialized corpus of speech-related early modern English texts. With Elena Semino, he produced the collection Cognitive Stylistics, Language and Cognition Text Analysis, with the specific aim of lending definition to the field of cognitive stylistics. Miriam Fried is professor of linguistics at the Charles University Prague. Her research interests include cognitive and functional aspects of language description and analysis, synchronic and diachronic, construction grammar, frame semantic. She's interested in the cognitive and functional aspects of language description and analysis, synchronic or diachronic, particularly in morphology and morphosyntax, for, uh, for instance, case marking alternation, subordination, word order, uh, relationship between lexical, meaning, and grammatical patterning, role of pragmatics in grammar. Her language interests include Czech, old and modern, and Sla Slavic data in general, Canada, Turkish, and Lithuanian as well. The theoretical frameworks close to her heart are construction grammar and frame semantics. Quite a bit of her work is concerned with specific analytic and representational issues within these models, especially as they relate uh, to questions of variability and change in grammatical structure, also through the lens of the grammaticalization theory. She also, uh, she's also working on the possibilities offered by large electronic corpora as sources of authentic, especially conversational, uh, conversational uh, data. Among other research projects, she has been the principal investigator of the European Structural Grant on creativity and adaptability as conditions for the success of Europe in an interrelated world. She was the principal investigator of the project on the nature of linguistic categorization through the study of categorial hybrid, um, diachronic evidence, and advisory member of the recent project meaning and its cognitive and neural correlates sponsored by the Nordic Organization for Coordinating Research in uh, the Humanities. And she was also a member of the research team on the FameNet project. We thank Michaela, Miriam, Jonathan very, very much for sharing their knowledge here, for being here with, with us. The round table and the discussion will focus on three main questions. Um, these main questions are related to significant aspects of the study of language change. That is why uh, it is the relevance of the study of language change for the modern approaches to linguistics. The second is how it is uh, the question of current methods and tools in the study of language change in relation to spoken and written corpora, quantitative, large corpora, and qualitative, small, specialized set of examples, selected methods. The third question, one, that is a question that concerns examples of important topics of language change, variational and or diachronic data. The structure of the roundtable is as follows. And Michaela starts with a 20, 25 minute presentation addressing the three aspects described above. And we continue with uh, five minutes question, one five minute qu question, one question from uh, the other two invited speakers, from Jonathan and Miriam. Jonathan continues with his uh, 20, 25 minute uh, presentation. And then we have questions from Michaela and Miriam. And we're going to continue with the presentation and then questions from Michael and Jonathan. And the floor then is given to all of you who are present here. Uh, we will summarize the, the main questions and we will have around 15 minutes for general discussion. So I would like to thank again our invited speakers at this round table and we may start the This is a very nice start. <laughs> uh, anyway, many thanks for this 
uh, solemn introduction and uh, well, we'll do our, at least I will we'll do our best not to disappoint um, you and uh, it's a great honor to be here. Um, okay, so um, in, uh, in my part, uh, in my presentation, I will um, focus, well, I'll try to answer um, the two um, questions, uh, the relevance of the study of language change for synchronic models and of current theorizing for the study of language change, focusing on a number of changes taking place in the encoding of argument structure in the passage from Latin to Romance, involving the rise of patterns of active coding in the nominal and verbal domains. So I will focus on accusative subjects and pleonastic reflexives and their interaction with the concomitant restructuring of the voice system. I would like to show you that the two-phase uh, theory of linking developed in role and reference grammar and uh, a gradient model of the lexico aspectual and thematic constraints on splitting transitivity put forward by Sorace insightfully account for the diachronic data dis discussed, revealing also paths of developments that might have analogous counterparts in other languages. And I would also like to show the insights gained from Sorace's split in transitivity hierarchy onto the introduction and cancellation of a split in transitivity system marked through auxiliary selection as witnessed in Southern Italo Romance. Latin, as is well known, is a prototypic, was a prototypic, um, prototypical nominative accusative language with some areas of active inactive coding of uh, um, the only argument of intransitive verbs, which we are not to deal with. The canonical linking of arguments to their grammatical function in Latin was for the active to have uh, an A or S um, argument as subjects um, and for the passive to have a no argument as subject using the familiar ASO um, uh, labels for core, the core arguments uh, of the clause. In late Latin, uh, there emerges uh, a phenomenon known in the literature as the extended accusative using a term originally introduced by Moravcesic. Um, the extension of the accusative case marking the object of a transitive verb in a nominative accusative system to encode the sole argument of some intransitive verbs, um, mainly denoting mental process, involuntary actions and existence. This issue has been discussed at length uh, in a wider typological perspective uh, by Franz Planck, who was actually the first scholar who deal with the issue of late Latin extend, of the late Latin extended accusative uh, bringing to light um, these data. Um, the phenomenon of accusative subjects or the extended accusative um, is well attested by the fourth century AD with an accusative patterns. So with equative clauses, passives, anticausatives, uh, and one argument verbs change of state. Can you hear me? Okay. And one argument verbs uh, denoting telic change of state. So we find contractionem, uh, um, there arises a spasm um, with uh, the, the verbal argument uh, contraction in the accusative, uh, or, we, or we find also sanguinem uh, exert, uh, the blood comes out. Again, the verbal argument is in the accusative and the verb uh, is a verb denoting telic change of location. At a later stage, um, the accusative also occurs uh, with essay arguments. So with uh, um, the only argument of non-agentive verbs uh, such as crackle, 
crepitavit panem, uh, and uh, later also with uh, agentive activity verbs, uh, with verbs uh, such as run, si ipsu vacuvit. More rarely, and uh, at, at a late stage, the accusative may also occur for the A argument of transitive verbs. In late Latin, this phenomenon preludes the elimination of the case system and the emergence of the accusative as the only case form in some areas of the Romania, mainly uh, the southern provinces of the empire. Another pattern of active alignment uh, attested at the same time as the accusative in subject function with uh, SO arguments um, is uh, a widely debated morphosyntactic chain known as uh, the proliferation of pleonastic reflexives. Uh, usually the distribution of uh, the accusative and dative reflexives uh, is regarded in the literature as idiosyncratic and uh, determinable only on a verb by verb, verb phase basis. And yet, um, a careful examination shows that the distribution appears to reflect um, the unaccusativity and unergative split. So, CB occurs uh, mainly with verbs denoting tilic change of step. So, um, to die, CB perire, um, verbs denoting tilic change of location, CB vadere, to go, CB fuggere, to run away, uh, states, CB manere, to remain, whereas, and also with uh, uh, the verb, with a copula, with the verb esse, to be. Uh, se, the accusative occurs with intransitive mental process verbs uh, to be spare, speech act verbs uh, to mourn, and later also with other activities uh, to perjure, uh, to tremble. The picture, however, is not clear cut. So there may occur alternations between the use of se and CB with some verbs uh, already during the, the early attestations of the phenomenon, fourth century AD. For instance, uh, with uh, uh, the verb go, vadere, uh, you could find uh, both the dative and the accusative uh, sometimes. Um, and this might be due to the equivalence between the accusative and dative forms of the reflexive pronoun already found by the fourth century AD. By the 8th, 9th century AD, the two parts converge. And the distinction between the two sets of intransitives becomes formally neutralized, owing to the equivalence between the dative and accusative forms of the reflexive, whereby se, the, the, the accusative comes to be used with an accusative verb, and the dative with an ergative. So, um, so you might find CB uh, periurare, for instance. And uh, this pattern of active alignment continues in the Romance languages to a different extent. And in some Southern Italo Romance varieties, for instance, uh, se, the reflexive from Latin sibi, uh, still identifies a subset of intransitive verbs, SO verbs. Concomitant with uh, the changes uh, uh, involving the rise of active uh, coding patterns uh, in the nominal and in the verbal domains, so the accusative in subject function with SO arguments and uh, um, a split in transitivity marked by um, the reflexive pronoun, uh, there occurs the restructuring of the voice system with uh, clear attestations from the end of the fourth century AD, but the examples that I'm using here are from later centuries. So you might find the passive inactive function, as in 2a, si quis libet eam quercebatur, where you have the verb in the medio passive form, the passive, the R form, and uh, um, the A argument, somebody in the nominative, and uh, uh, the O argument in the accusative. But we could also find the active in passive function, as in 3b, 
patents ut pereius adiutorium liberaret, where liberaret active stands for liberator passive, and the sentence means asking to be set free with his help. So the functional equivalence and interchangeability among voice forms uh, signals a violation of the canonical rules assigning grammatical functions to the arguments of the verb. And uh, as long as case marking operated on a nominative accusative basis, um, it could still be identified uh, um, that the status of the A, O or S arguments could still be identified. But once case marking may pattern initially on an active, inactive, and then subsequently on a neutral basis, as witnessed by accusative subjects with an accusative transitive structures, it is difficult to assign a grammatical function to the argument of verbs and to detect their A, O, or S status. And so the interplay between the, the responding of the voice system with the active no longer signaling an A or S argument uh, um, and, uh, the passive no longer signaling a no argument in subject function comes to affect argument structure as well. So the data, the diachronic data that I have briefly um, discussed uh, point to two stages in the organization of the coding of the argument structure of the clause in the transition from Latin to Romance. The violation of the canonical rules assigning grammatical functions to the arguments as a result of the functional equivalence and interchangeability among voice forms, and the difficulty in identifying the grammatical function and the thematic role of core arguments um, as a result of the, the active neutral realignment of the morphological tools for their encoding, case marking at some point agreement as well, intersecting with the functional equivalence among voice forms. So uh, the data point to the need for a model of argument structure that distinguishes between two steps. The assignment of syntactic functions to the clause in Euclid arguments and the identification of the clause in Euclid arguments. Their status as SA, SO, or O. A possible answer seems to come to me um, from the role and reference grammar um, two-phase linking um, uh, perspective. Uh, role and reference grammar, as is well known, is a monostratal theory of grammar, positing only one level of syntactic representation and direct linking between the lexical semantic and syntactic levels, mediated by the semantic macro roles of actor and undergore subsuming the different thematic relations, agent, effector, theme, patient. So mapping takes place in two phases. Um, first, you map the arguments in logical structures into macro roles, and then you map the macro roles and other arguments into the syntax. The first part is regarded as universal. The second part is language specific. Now, uh, the notion of linking as consisting of two phases seems to apply to the late Latin data because one could say that the use of the passive in active function and of the active in passive function signals a violation of the rules linking macro roles to grammatical functions, uh, but the macro roles are still assigned a grammatical function. When case marking no longer operates on a nominative accusative basis, uh, then uh, the whole system of argument structure gets restructured because uh, um, the whole, it's not just the, the assignment uh, of macro role status. Uh, and so um, the interplay between the two phenomena, uh, a verb that no longer has voice and an argument whose syntactic and semantic status is unclear, signals a change uh, affecting not only the linking of arguments, so of macro roles to the syntax, phase two of linking, but to the assignment of macro role status 
and thematic relations. So this notion also allows one to show that uh, changes involving step two occur earlier and are less disruptive because the use of the passive inactive function, uh, so-called deponentization in, the, in, in Latin, the Latin literature, um, is attested throughout the history of the language. But uh, the change uh, does not affect uh, the whole uh, encoding of argument structure because case marking and agreement rules uh, uh, follow the, uh, the nominative accusative pattern. Um, as far as uh, the split intransitive system that uh, I uh, presented, uh, um, instantiated by pronastic reflexives, uh, is concerned, um, I would like to show you how the gradient model put forward by Sorace in an upper work, a model that starts from um, uh, the results of the, the acquisitional path of uh, um, the auxiliary selection L2, can neatly allow us uh, to show that uh, um, CB and C in late Latin identify uh, two subclasses of intransitive verbs with the dative CB occurring with uh, um, change of state verbs, uh, CB mori to die, CB naspi to be born, and interestingly with uh, this type, with this, um, um, with, uh, this type of verbs, uh, you never find a se. Um, also, at, uh, you know, in later um, texts. Um, alternation between CB and C um, uh, occur, well, CB also occurs with vadere uh, um, to go, um, with uh, um, um, continuation of state to remain, uh, existence of a state, uncontrolled process, where, uh, however, one finds C. Um, to get, and, and we find C also with uh, uh, verbs uh, denoting um, activity uh, such as walk uh, or perjure. And uh, in the, the split in transitivity hierarchy put forward by Sorace, um, verbs at the core of the categories, uh, um, change of state, tidic change of state, uh, uh, and uh, activity verbs uh, uh, never um, show variation, whereas variation um, increases as one uh, um, as we move from from um, as, as the degree of telicity of the verb uh, decreases, uh, and uh, uh, also the the agentivity of the subject uh, um, decreases. So. Um, the two main um, semantic parameters at the heart of this hierarchy are um, aspect, telicity, and uh, agentivity. Um, this model also allows, um, allows us to show um, how um, the rise and fall of a split S system marked through auxiliary selection um, follows uh, implicational um, paths uh, uh, that uh, uh, would not be um, detected uh, without uh, uh, the lenses of the theory. And so uh, uh, the, 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 the data considered are Pompei, Sorrento, e Portici uh, for, um, for the synchrony and uh, um, in these varieties, in these varieties where have is the only auxiliary, one starts finding the um, intrusion of B as an auxiliary, starting uh, from core unaccusatives and then going down uh, the hierarchy. So with an implicational hierarchy. So you never find B with a verb denoting the continuation of a state. Um, and not with uh, uh, verbs denoting uh, change of state, for instance. And uh, the phenomenon 
uh, well, the hierarchy also um, accounts uh, for the reverse uh, change, the penetration of have uh, into a system such as old Neapolitan, 14th, 15th century texts, uh, where uh, there was a, a clear cut distinction between uh, unaccusatives and unergative verbs, uh, unaccusatives selecting be, unergatives selecting have. Here, the change uh, sees uh, the spread of have into the be domains. And again, there is an implicational lexical hierarchy. Um, you have variation with uh, verbs at the periphery of the hierarchy of unaccusativity, verbs denoting continuation of a state, so remain, state, tidic change of location, go. Um, but you never find uh, um, have with a verb such as die or be born or burst. So with the core of the category with an accusativity. So the data show the striking convergence between the synchronic and diachronic implication of relationships among verb classes on the ash. Um, and uh, today's dialects point to the penetration of B into a system that only selects have as a perfective auxiliary. So the reintroduction of the distinction between two subclasses of intransitives marked through auxiliary selection. The early vernacular shows the penetration of have into the functional domains of B, so the elimination of the distinction between two subclasses of intransitives through auxiliary selection. The two changes appear to proceed in a reverse way, but consistent with the split intransitivity hierarchy and its implication of relationships. And so a gradient model of split intransitivity appears to offer interesting insights into how a split intransitivity system may arise and be cancelled and may be counterparts in other languages. Um, and so, uh, for my part, I hope that I'm... Oh, one minute. Okay, fine. So, uh, I hope to um, have shown you uh, how um, theory informs the data or allows us the interpretation of diachronic data without uh, the split intransitivity hierarchy uh, we would have not been able to detect the rise of a, um, an active inactive system in late Latin. Um, at, at the same time, diachronic data uh, can also suggest some improvements to the theory. Because, for instance, uh, um, in uh, Sorace's uh, uh, hierarchy, the core is instantiated by verbs denoting tidic change of location where the diachronic data from Old Neapolitan and from Late Latin show that the core of the category is instantiated by eight verbs. And uh, um, also, um, synchronic data can allow us to try and uh, organize uh, changes uh, affecting, for instance, the argument structure and the voice system in the transition from late Latin to Romance, um, that otherwise we would have just to list as phenomena. Um, so I uh, hope that I uh, haven't rushed too much. And I leave the floor to uh, my colleague, Jonathan. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, Esther. Can everybody hear me? Is this working actually? Uh, yes, no, no. Okay, thank you for a really rich talk and rich material. Uh, I will just have one smallish specific question. Uh, I was interested in the uh, argument structure changes because that of course is a big topic uh, and the patterns are very interesting but I am wondering if uh, it's only an issue of the arguments 
and assigning roles to them? Or could it also be uh, that the passive morphology of the work forms either triggers or facilitates the changes in the argument structure uh, assignments? Because it seems to me there must be some neutralization of the passive morphology in terms of its function or something like that. Um, uh, yes, well, um, the point is that uh, what happens in, uh, in, in the Latin uh, is that uh, on the one hand you find uh, the rise of this uh, active inactive system, uh, mark, you know, the accusative in subject function. But concomitant with these changes, uh, with this change, you find also a reorganization of voice distinctions. The, so it's a, you see, the passive morphology gets lost. So the, the change that, uh, the changes that I am, uh, have discussed have been as a part of uh, um, uh, a much debated of late Latin and Romantic. Uh, syntax, uh, so the demise of the passive, the rise of the one. So, um, at some point in my perspective, uh, accusative subjects, so active, inactive, and uh, neutral coding um, or alignment of uh, or arguments, uh, comes to clash. It interacts, it, it intersects with. Uh, um, the confusion among voice forms. And so up until, you know, you could have a, a, a passive form, but uh, the verbal arguments uh, were marked uh, uh, as nominative and accusative. Um, this did not create uh, a problem for comprehension. But when, uh, and also, you know, you see it in texts, at times, it is very difficult uh, in some texts to detect the status, the role of uh, the A or O argument or the SO. Um, I have an example, but maybe we can discuss it uh, uh, later. Um, okay, thanks. Is that working? Yes. Um, thank you, Nicholas, for the words of welcome at the beginning. Thank you, audience, for being here, even though I'm sure a, the thought of a cold cocktail elsewhere is more attractive than anything I could possibly say. Um, but hopefully this will be something a bit interesting for you. You're getting variety in this round table. Um, I'm not going centrally for case studies. I'm actually talking about a whole area. I'm talking about historical pragmatics, and I'll use a couple of case studies to illustrate things. Uh, I am not going to go through the detail. But I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear. OK, so um, thinking about historical pragmatics, um, and uh, I want to think about a couple of data problems. And these actually have resonance for synchronic uh, issues as well. The problem uh, is that um, Pragmatic theories are largely developed from spoken interaction. Um, and you just think of labels like utterance, speaker, hearer, all that, even speech act theory. Um, but once we go you know, into the past, uh, the re tape recorder hasn't been, or the phonograph hasn't been around for that long, we've only got written records. So um, that isn't very promising uh, in some ways. And maybe historical pragmatics is a non starter. Not so. There are three arguments why historical pragmatics um, is, is viable, and it's the third one that has synchronic re resonance. Okay, so you might say this, um, as indeed uh, Fleischmann did, uh, that medieval texts actually uh, are structured in, 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 in a way that sort of is much more reminiscent of spoken uh, language anyway. Uh, and so they say actually much closer. They're much more oral uh, in all sorts of ways. Well, that's one argument, possibly. Or another argument is that, um, don't worry, you can infer much about spoken interaction from speech-related text types. We could go down that route and we can look at trial proceedings 
handbooks in dialogue form, play texts, and so on. And lots of people in historical pragmatics, including myself, have done this. Um, but the really interesting one is actually this one. Maybe pragmatic theory need not be restricted to spoken data. Um, a point made by Jacobs and Yuka, written texts can be analyzed as communicative acts in their own right. Uh, and I think this one is the central thing. Pragmatics need not be uh, restricted. The label suggests that it is. Um, but actually, that's not the key thing here. And this has been demonstrated um, over the last uh, couple of decades uh, by the work on, for example, academic writing. Uh, there's a, a, quite a famous study analyzing a, a, a journal article on transformational uh, generative grammar, uh, pointing out that it's full of pragmatic devices, mitigations, face-saving things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's all there. So there's no reason why we can't treat written uh, texts as communicative acts in their own right. They're a bit different, but we can uh, treat them in that way. So I, I think we can ignore the idea that it has to be spoken. So communicative or interactive data maybe is the thing. Not spoken, it's got to be interactive. Maybe that is it. But if we say interactive, well, in a sense, all linguistic data is interactive. So that, this is vacuous. This is saying nothing. So that's, you know, pragmatics can do anything. Well, maybe it could, but I don't think that's the key thing. I think the key, key for pragmatics, it, it thrives on interactions, and particularly interactions that are rapid and complex. Uh, and, and that's why there has been a focus in many uh, pragmatic studies on dialogic data, uh, because you get that sort of stuff there. Historically, again, it's meant a preference for that dialogic data, for plays, for trial proceedings, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see I've come back to those genres. They do it uh, for pragmatics in many ways. Another problem, uh, it's context. This is a big problem for uh, pragmatics, because pragmatic scholars would agree that Context is absolutely essential, a defining feature for the, for the field. Um, but hmm, historically, uh, we don't have most of the context. So that's a bit of a problem. Uh, and again, historical pragmatics would seem to be a non-starter. However, uh, not, not, not quite. We have co-text, kind of context, um, and uh, corpus-based approaches that thrive on that. Uh, texts often create their own contexts. So who is talking to whom? We get that from a text often. Um, and some texts describe context, and this is where historians get their information from, texts talking about what's happening and so forth. So actually, even from the linguistic data, we are getting a lot of stuff about context. So it's not zero. Um, we just have to bear in mind the, um, the reality of where it's coming from and the limitations of that. Thinking more generally about methodological approaches uh, in historical pragmatics, I, I would say there are two main ways. And this first one is the most frequent one. You start with the form, and then you extrapolate to the function. This is what normally happens. It could be single words, expressions, whatever you'd like. Um, this is certainly the, the dominant way uh, of moving forward. It's not the only one. I mean, uh, this partly explains why corpus linguistics uh, the corpus-based method has been particularly prominent in historical uh, pragmatics because you start with the form, you look it up in your corpus, and go and move on from there. But there are other ways of doing it. You can start with function, and uh, some studies do do that. Uh, speech chat functions, brightness, impliedness, genres, whatever you want. I I'm going to be uh, introducing little illustrations of these uh, in a bit. I think the key problem with this one, and this is definitely a, a synchronic problem as well, uh, is the tertium imperationis, um, the idea that if you're doing a comparison, you need some similarities in common. If I say an orange is different from a car, that's a trivial thing. We know they're different. But if we're comparing an orange with a tomato, they have some things in common, seeds, and some things that are different. And this is where it becomes interesting. That's why we need that in place. The problem is, when we're doing comparisons over time, often everything's changing. So if you take a, a speech act from 500 years ago and say, well, I'm going to then look at that speech act 200 years ago and see what forms are, uh, are relevant in both, well, that might have changed as well. And synchronically, it's exactly the same. People have done comparisons of apologies today with, in, in British English with apologies in Japanese. But actually, the notion of apology is different in Japanese from the notion of apology 
in uh, British English. So you've actually got those aren't the sort of things to hang on to either. Uh, so it's a problem either way, uh, synchronically or diachronically. Okay, quick case study. Um, uh, affirmatives in English. Um, I started being interested in this after I was talking to an accountant who was convinced all languages would have a sort of logical function like a tick, and that would be the affirmative function. It's not at all like that. There, there are actually quite a few functions that affirmatives can perform. Even their etymologies, as you can see there, are a little bit more complex uh, and quite controversial. I won't run through all the ones there. Obviously, I could have put more in there. I want to go straight to the English one because that is um, seriously controversial, how the word yes came about. Uh, my, there are, I think there are three um, uh, theories uh, for it, but um, uh, I'm going to give you my favorite one in a minute. So if we go back a thousand odd years uh, to Old English, there were two ways of saying yes. One is yay, I'm going to pronounce it like that, uh, it was slightly different a uh, thousand years ago, uh, which is basically the, from the Proto-Germanic yar, same uh, root. Uh, the other is the yes, and this is the one where we don't really know where it comes from. Uh, it's, we think the first part is yay, it's yay something. And that's the key thing, what is the something? I agree with Wallach and uh, Van der Werf that actually uh, it's probably uh, yay, hit, is swa, is which is yay, it is so. Um, and um, if you think about how it's, uh, that's evolved into yes, well, you know, children often drop um, uh, subjects like it, yes, it is so, yes, is so, you might say, as a child. So that's quite a regular thing to drop. And then phonological process is produced final form. So I think this is plausible, certainly more plausible than the other ones, but I haven't got time to go through them. Okay, so that's uh, where that one comes from. The other interesting thing about Old English is it's not just got the two forms, but they're used for different things, and um, particularly in relation to the uh, questioning, question answer system. So if you want to give a positive polarity response to a positive utterance, uh, you would use yay. Um, uh, you know, did you effectively yay I did, was what you would say. If you want to give uh, a positive polarity response to a negative utterance, you would use yes. So, didn't you, and then, yes, I did, is what you would say. That's how it worked. If I go to the modern day situation, um, the situation is worse. We now have an ambiguity. We don't have that nice system. We have an ambiguity. This is an example that happened between me and my, one of my daughters. Uh, Emily said, didn't you take my costume out of the washing machine? I said, yes, that's very unhelpful. Um, and Emily says, what? Um, because there are two interpretations. This would not have happened in Old English. Um, one, yes, I confirm what you say, that you didn't take your costume out of the washing machine. It confirms the negative proposition, didn't you? Uh, the negative proposition in the question that Jonathan did not take the costume out. But actually, there's another reading. Uh, yes, I confirm what you suspect, that I did take your costume out of the washing machine. In the light of doubt, she can't find it. Emily's question asks for confirmation of her belief that Jonathan did not did take the costume out. So it com confirms the positive implicature. There's this ambiguity. No resolution today. In the past, if I had said yes, then uh, with yes is the equivalent of yay, it is so, then actually the first interpretation would not have, uh, would have been canceled out um, because it, it blocks the, um, the, the negative proposition. And actually in this case, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, as would be typical in Old English, uh, I'm giving the positive answer, Johnson did take the, the uh, costume out. Uh, so, so this has been lost actually, um, it, interestingly, in how it works out. Now what, what I'm particularly interested in, in when was it lost? Uh, when do we lose this nice system? Uh, uh, and my particular period I'm interested in is early modern English, so I wanted to check that out. So I lo I've looked around for accounts of why the system was breaking down. Uh, Benjamin points out that um, modern German ja, with the same root, root as ye, uh, is much more frequent uh, in, uh, than, than, than yes in English. It's much more frequent in Germ German than yes in English, even in the same context. He's th actually thinking about wedding vows, where in, Engl in English he would say, I do, and he claims that, I don't know whether it's true, I see some nods, you say ya, it's the answer, whether you take a person, as the, whatever, you know what I mean. Um, 
she also points out that, and this is the particularly interesting thing, that you can avoid saying yes and using affirmative at all. You can just say, I did. Didn't you take my costume out of the washing machine? I did. Or I didn't. You could just say that. You don't have to use the affirmative. Um, and also points out that Irish has no exact equivalent of yes or no. Wait, Welsh favours those I did or I didn't, doesn't use the affirmative either. So maybe it's the Celtic influence of those languages that's destabilising the system um, and producing what we have today. That's the possibility. I don't know. When, when was it destabilised? And so this is what I had a look at in particular. Um, around 400 years ago, there were three, actually three affirmatives. I've been talking about two. Yes, yay. There was also I, which develops from the adverb ever. I haven't got time to talk about that one. Um, uh, yay is the one that's disappeared. The other two actually still exist. So um, I got hold of my instances of um, uh, yes and I and yay and all the rest of it. That, and uh, looked at how many the ones following questions. And if you look at the highlight, this is the key thing. It is still following the pattern. You don't get yay after a negative question, which is exactly what the system would, would, would predict. And what you, instead, you get yes after uh, a negative question. So it's definitely still in place. Yay was uh, uh, receding anyway, uh, and about 100 years after this, it pretty much gone. So it was still in place at that point. Um, I just wanted a snapshot of something else that I did. I haven't got time to talk in detail about it. It's really a matter of potential. You can look at collocations of things. Um, and I did that for yes, yay, and I. Um, and what I've done, th this is about six tables, and I've collated them into one. You have the, the key, the word, the node word in the middle, the affirmative, and you have the collocations to the left and right uh, of these, and these are statistically the, the collocations. Um, now, you will note that it includes punctuation marks. This is because I use the program CQP Web, which treats punctuation marks um, as a token. I think this is useful because parsers of early modern English are not good uh, at all. Um, uh, and uh, what the punctuation gives us is a sort of proxy to that. You will note that you get, uh, for example, to the left, you get exclamation marks, question marks, full stops. That's because a question or a sentence is, is, is complete, and then in initial position, you then have yes, sometimes yay, and sometimes I. What I have highlighted in yellow is the comma for yay. Now, why are we getting a comma before yay? That's because this is the one, not the other ones. Yay is the one that, that uh, at, sometimes occurs in medial position, not in initial position as in the example at the bottom. Has not a snail, a spider, yay, a newt been found here? This is very different. This is not like an affirmative to, uh, 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 addressing the, the person who just asked the question. This is almost like a thought process that's going through the speaker's mind. Indeed, this is really what's going on. So it's a very different kind of usage. So the collocates can, can tap into this kind of thing. There are other things that will come out of this. I haven't got time to go through them. But it gives you an idea of what's going on with these things. Quick, this is a faster case study, only about three slides, um, uh, for requests. And I want to talk about this because normally when people look at speech acts, they start with form and they go to function. I decided to be awkward and do it the other way around. Um, and so I went from function to form. I read through with a, a colleague, a Dawn Archer, we read through, um, I think, about uh, 150,000 words of uh, 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 transcripts from uh, trials and uh, play texts. And every time we hit a, a request, we uh, coded it off so we could retrieve it later. Uh, so that, it captured all kinds of requests, so it, so it was great from that point of view. If you start with form, you've got to have the forms, so you've got to decide where they come from. If you start with the function, you get the whole lot. Uh, the downside is extremely labor intensive. Um, oops. Um, okay, so what do we find? Um, well, um, went through 1,200 requests, um, and one in three requests were made with a simple imperative. Fetch me the water, get me gone, bake the bread. Um, today, only one in 10 requests are made like that uh, with a simple imperative. The most common um, uh, construction is, is could you, followed by can you. 
Uh, I've done another study, and those don't emerge in English doing requests until the middle of the, uh, the 19th century, um, so quite late. In this period, uh, that didn't, wasn't even being used for requests. Um, so mostly they were using direct forms. There were indirect forms around, and the most common ones actually are my EG example, with the will you, volition one, also let, let us and let us let me, uh, those were around uh, as indirect forms. Who was using them? So I looked at that, uh, and in both the trial data and the drama data, it was the high status people who were using those indirect forms. This is diametrically opposed to what Brown and Levinson would predict. They would predict that all the indirectness, all the mitigation, all the off-record stuff is being used by the low status people. Uh, so uh, this is quite interesting that this result is flying in the face of what normally is the case uh, today. Okay, I've got the final slides are just summary points, bringing back in uh, some of the issues of the round table. I hope it's been obvious that I've been dipping in and out right the way across these case studies of the synchronic and the diachronic. I mean, that's fairly obvious. More specifically, um, I think with regard to theory, um, the, the issues in historical pragmatics show that uh, it, the spoken bias is, is not merely surmountable. Actually, it's not, not a good reflection of pragmatics. We should not be in the thrall of spoken interaction. Interaction, yes. Rapid and complex, yes, great. Um, but it needn't be spoken. Some people have developed a theory in that uh, way. Jakob Mayer's talks of it's not speech acts, but pragnemes and pracs uh, and that kind of thing. Also, we need to expand what we're thinking about when we're dealing with written text, particularly in the digital world. Um, it's not merely subjective, the speaker and the hearer subjective or intersubjective. No, a lot of digital communication is very much about the third party out there. The, it's the extended subjectivity of everything that you want to take into account all those other people on Twitter uh, or whatever it is. Um, so uh, that's how we need to develop some of the theoretical apparatus. Methodological approach, yes, I hope I've shown that form, function, function form. This is obviously quite applicable to synchronic work. Uh, as well. Um, the, the historical pragmatics lack of access to uh, context has definitely biased things towards corpus linguistics, I suspect. I also think this is not um, unknown in the synchronic world too. Um, it's often very difficult to collect all the contextual data you would need in all the languages and all the cultures you want to go and visit. There's a lot of money involved um, and I've seen lots of studies that use corpora to do it and I suspect there are economic issues behind some of that. So is corpus pragmatics the solution? Uh, well, it has some um, positives. It's great for examples, great for quantifying regularity, conventionalized structures, etc. Identifying meanings and discourse structures, you know, between collocations and that sort of thing, uh, etc., etc. But I, I would, uh, I'm going to include my, my final slide is all about be careful. Uh, here are the things to be careful about. Final slide. The corpus data is, don't, don't blindly assume the corpus data is all that there is. There's always stuff outside. Um, that the corpus is big enough, it might not be. Uh, the corpus is representative or represents what you think it does. Um, I've had some experience, some uh, talks and papers where someone thinks that something is in the corpus. And I've doubted that actually it does do that. Um, that it can be a proxy for other kinds of data. Um, some people have spoken about informal data being a proxy for spoken interactional data. I don't think so. I think it's a slightly different thing. Um, that the meanings, functions of pragmatic units are stable across a corpus or corpora. They're probably not. Um, that you've got the relevant context. You probably don't. You might have some of it, but not necessarily. Check it. Um, that the numerical patterns will interpret themselves. They don't. Humans are needed for that one. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want totally put you off it, but just proceed with caution. And I would say those issues are relevant to both diachronic and synchronic work.
got many thanks. Uh, I have um, a question concerning um, the different statistics, the statistics for request forms and politeness. And uh, you, you showed us that uh, diachronic data go against uh, uh, the politeness theory. So. Yes, I, I didn't say much about that in my haste. Uh, so thanks for the question. Uh, you may be wondering why. So, so what's the reason uh, this is the case? And I, I think the reason is that uh, Brown and Levinson and modern politeness theories are all about the other person. So you say these things to, to uh, soften what you're, the impact on the other person. I think 400 years ago, it was much more about the self. These uh, uh, indirectness strategies, these blindness strategies were adornment for the high class people. And it's not just in English. Marcel Bass uh, did a study on historical Dutch, and he made the same point. I, I think back then, uh, it was a, a system which is much more about the self and less about the other. Today, I think it's more about the other. I wouldn't say, you know, who knows for a variety of cultures uh, and languages, with how many it. I always suspect there are some there which have a, uh, a bit of an emphasis on the self as well. Even in British English, sometimes we do things to look good uh, and we're not so worried about the other person. Anyway, that's some, that's just partly a speculation. Thank you. Good late afternoon, early evening. Uh, thanks, Nikos, for making me part of this panel. I feel slightly out of place, but I will try my best. Um, I should start by saying that uh, the work that I do uh, in terms of connecting diachronic and synchronic analyses uh, is generally framed by this general question of how novel and sometimes unexpected linguistic patterns actually work their way into uh, an existing linguistic system. And in addition to that, where does that change actually happen? What is the domain or what is the locus of change? So uh, I am first gonna show it on a specific example, uh, which can be summarized as the question of how do we lose a main clause and what happens when that happens uh, in conversational language. And specifically, I will illustrate what I then wanna make the broader points on, on the phenomenon known as insub insubordination. Uh, so if we take Evans' uh, uh, definition, it deals with uh, independently uh, acting clauses that formally, however, look like subordinate clauses. So there is this mismatch and disconnect. What do they look like? Just so you get a sense. Uh, so if we take an example from English, if only you stop nagging me, uh, which really is not a conditional clause, it is not a question, it does something entirely different, but it looks like a normal if clause. And because I work on Czech, I'm gonna bother you with a couple of examples from Czech just to start us off. So here we have the temporal or causal connective uh, gdish, which means when or if, but when we see this independently without any main clause, the that the interpretation is something other than temporal or causal. And similarly, if we have these yes clauses, uh, where yes is the equivalent of the English if slash weather, uh, again, we get a completely different interpretation if we don't have the main clause. So that's one layer of problems. And the other one is that we kind of wanna know what happened to those little guys. Uh, why is it that they no longer mean what they seem to mean, mean or suggest? So um, in addition to what, what it is that we are looking at, the phenomenon itself, we want to ask where do they come from? How, how do they actually uh, come into being? What is it that actually changes? And what motivates and facilitates the changes? So it's, it's a whole bundle of fairly complicated questions. So just to get us uh, oriented in the type of structures that I'm talking about is here we have a standard example of an embedded, well-behaved embedded yes, no question. Um, but it's gone, you know, I don't know if somebody destroyed it. And what interests us is that in the uh, green bracket, uh, we have the main clause, I don't know, and then we have the embedded clause. So altogether, it's totally transparent, compositional, I don't know, if, be. 
But then we have the insubordinate variants of this clause, uh, which is not a biclausal structure anymore, it's a monoclausal structure. And one possible interpretation, among many, I should say, I will just mention two here. It was the whole roof was pockmarked from hail. I guess maybe somebody's tried to fix it earlier. And what's conspicuous is we don't have any, I don't know, or any other main clause that would introduce this uh, insubordinate clause. And also the overall interpretation is, I think that may be P. So I'm no longer claiming complete not knowledge or, or asking a question. I'm just saying, eh, this is my guess. And then there is another interpretation of the same form. Uh, here you, we have a, a tiny excerpt from a dialogue. Uh, well, to drag the car to Colleen doesn't make sense on account of batteries, you know. And the interlocutor says, uh, yeah, well, I doubt Otto even has a battery. And again, we have the same pattern. No main clause to identify anywhere in, in either of these uh, uh, turns. And the overall interpretation is just the opposite of the, of the number two. I think that probably not be. So this is, this is one subset of, of examples. Um, so there are a few things that need to be said about this shift from the biclausal structure to the monoclausal structure. Uh, so in the normal biclausal structures, semantically, we are expecting a certain class, lexical class of predicates, lack of knowledge of various kinds. We also can substitute this more colloquial, or I should say even neutral, yesly with uh, the equivalent of weather, which is stylistically a little marked. Uh, then the typical prototypical uh, order of the two, cla uh, two clauses is that the main clause comes first, introduces the, in uh, the embedded clause, and that comes second. So that's really the focal point of the whole structure, whereas the main clause is the topical part. Uh, the meaning, as I said, is so totally compositional. If I know what the main clause means and what the subordinate clause means, I'm good. I know what the whole thing means. And there are no textual or uh, genre or stylistic uh, uh, restrictions. So now the question is how we get from here to the two insubordinate variants. Because we have really something that looks like a single form. But depending on in which context we find them, and I mean discourse context, one will be behaving one way and the other one beha behaving the other way. So in the informational discourse, we have something that I have been calling potential explanation. And the meaning is, I think that may be P. So the, the, the Yesley marker, which is uh, an original uh, syntactic complementizer, really is more of an explicative uh, contextualizer, let's just say. Uh, there could be a, a formal, uh, formal sign of this uh, uh, construction, we don't need to go into it. Now, pragmatically, what's important is that these, th this variant of the structure actually expresses minimal confidence of the speaker. It's like, okay, I don't really know, but this is my best guess. You do whatever you see fit with it, and we can then uh, elaborate. And what is even more interesting is that there are intonational differences that this particular structure is associated very robustly with a slightly rising contour and uh, with the, the inconclusive pattern, which we know universally, or at least cross-linguistically, let's say, is associated with uncertainty. And then uh, we also looked at the phonetics of it, and it turns out that these meanings are associated with much more reduced speech. There is phonetically a, a, a real uh, reduction. So when we compare this with the argumentative context, then we get something that looks a lot more like a counter argument, uh, where the speaker is really saying, probably it's not that, that's what I think. Uh, so the yesly part, the, the connector, really is more like an adversity marker. Again, it has a, a, a formal possibility, let's not worry about it. Pragmatically, the speaker actually exp expresses high confidence that not be. So there is this uh, epistemic difference between those two. Intonationally, this one is associated with a clearly falling uh, intonation and the conclusive pattern, therefore. And phonetically, this is less reduced. The speaker is more careful about saying, hey, I really don't think this is how it is. Uh, there are other issues that can be explored. I'm not going to go into them because there are interesting interactions with negation and there is also additional speech act functions, but we don't need to 
uh, waste time on it. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. But what I do want to uh, point, uh, point out to you is that this is a really multi-layered change. So uh, there is semantic change, uh, which has to do with the incorporation of the meaning of uncertainty and the, the subjective epistemic attitude. There is something that could be called deconstruction, uh, decategorization, uh, because we are really going from one part of speech to a different part of speech on the, on the yesly part. Uh, there is the structural uh, issue of uh, having to have the yesly clause first, and then maybe or may maybe not the, the main clause will follow, which of course the interlocutor doesn't know if it will come or not. So that's, that's an open issue for him, and we can skip that. So this is just a, a general example of something that uh, are the phenomena that interest me, and that brought me to uh, the, the relationship between grammaticalization research and construction grammar. Um, because they really do have quite a bit of com in common. Uh, for example, the, the, the belief, <laughs> the, the conviction that uh, language is permanently variable. So we really have to, symphonically, diachronically, it doesn't matter, we have to keep going um, for the uh, uh, variations. And any kind of variation or change will be grounded in the speaker's communicative practice and cognitive capacity for uh, changing the mental representations. And so the, the source of changes will always be language use, which is very good for construction grammar and makes usage-based characters. So the role of context, uh, as Jonathan talked about it, the focus on the fact that language is really dynamic, that change is gradual, and that we always are involved in very complex structures and patterns. So we see it right here in, the, in this insubordination uh, example that it is really an interaction of many layers of changes. And I would really like to emphasize that there really is not that much difference between doing symphonic variation and diachronic change, at least uh, conceptually. Uh, now, construction grammar was originally uh, developed, of course, as we know, uh, for synchronic description. But it very easily extended into diachrony and specifically through grammaticalization research. It was really grammaticalization folks who started saying, hey, maybe this is a model that could help us uh, model and conceptualize these things. So we worked with the notion of construction, uh, which is a basic unit of analysis that comes out of usage. And it's really always a hypothesis about what you think uh, the mental representation is and also how it changes over time. It's a multi-dimensional object, which again helps in capturing a complex multi-layer change like the Yesley clauses uh, are showing. And because it has internal structure, it also gives us a way of zeroing in on individual little features that may be uh, uh, the that may carry the, the gradualness of the change. And as I said, they are internally structured, the construction. So if we just, for those of you who may not be familiar with construction grammar, uh, I'll just walk you now through examples of where the two meet uh, based on the Yesley clauses, the insubordination. So what really is one of the um, strong indications of a change in the making or change that has happened is the interaction between the internal structure and what conventionally uh, on the outside the whole construction actually expresses. So if I just uh, visualize it for you, okay, we have a construction, the construction consists of certain things, and overall it will also have some function or meaning that will not be directly readable from the, from the constituents from the internal structure. And I'm just going to now quickly go through the cases where this is exemplified by the insubordination clauses I showed you at the beginning. So the tension between the holistic constructional function and the internal form and the internal indications is what increases always non-compositionality. And here we clearly have non-compositional structures. Because internally, syntactically, it looks just like a normal subordinate clause. But holistically, it's an assertion. It's not a question to begin with. It's an assertion, and it's either positive certainty or negative certainty. That, that doesn't come from the internal structure, obviously. Another uh, issue is that the internal structure can be reshaped. And when it does, then the overall also changes. So for the out 
case here, it's the change from biclausal to monoclausal, the loss, the erosion of the, uh, the original constituent structure. Uh, because we have access to the internal uh, features of every construction, we can also zero in on whatever is inherited from the original structure and still survives in the new one. So we just get this connection. And that applies to the international business here, because it turns out, and I can go into the details of it, but just trust me, I published, <laughs> I published it already, uh, that there are certain hints already in the embedded questions in the biclausal structures that kind of get uh, inherited by these two different interpretations. Um, and so I would say also it supports uh, Bill Kraft's, uh, he calls it radical, I don't think it's that radical, claim uh, that the part of speech status really comes out of constructions, that if we don't have the whole pattern, we don't necessarily have a good definition of uh, a given uh, part of speech. So here we go from the syntactic complementizer to the discourse contextualizer, and all the other things have to be true for this to be true. Uh, and then, uh, Looking at the, at the earlier stages or looking at the relationship between the new one and, and its source, it gives us a way of integrating this new pattern, this insubordinate pattern, into broader constructional networks in which we can show that it's, the, the new ones are part of an epistemic space because we express certain epistemic, epistemic meanings, but in form, it also overlaps with a different system, namely the embedded question, uh, uh, subordinate clauses. And in both in form and behavior, the insubordinate clauses partially overlap with various transitional structures, which I didn't have time to talk about, but they are there. So, so the network really gives us a nice picture of how the mental representations really shift and on what layers and, and, and uh, all the things that have to be involved in, in um, describing and explaining and conceptualizing the change that we observe. And that brings me to the last question that the round table uh, is asking, and that is, okay, so is there anything that the historical and, and I prefer to say diachronic and synchronic uh, analyses have in common? And I would say, uh, Absolutely. <laughs> um, first of all, in both cases, we can use corpus material. And I, I don't want to overstate this. I know that there are problems with uh, corpora, but as long as we are aware of it and take it as, okay, there is this hedge, we understand the, uh, the limitations. It is authentic language, uh, and it does give us access to context and focus, just like uh, Jonathan was talking about. Uh, once we have access to reasonably uh, sizable corpora, we can also do certain frequency-based uh, analyses, and that tells us a lot also about the changes, where they happen, why they happen. Uh, and we see both of these cases in the insubordination uh, phenomenon. If we have a big enough corpus, of course, we can do more sophisticated quantitative analysis, not just counting, but that's in historical, with historical material, I understand this is a lot uh, uh, iffier. I didn't have to do much of that. Um, then also there is, has been literature on, uh, fairly recent literature, on how the statistical uh, analysis of sufficiently uh, informative corpora can give us a sense of how a given change, change spreads through the community. And that is really not easy to do, and one has to issue a lot of caveats, but there are certain uh, uh, studies that kind of show us, yeah, okay, maybe this is one way of, of getting to it. And then as the corpora expand, become bigger and more sophisticated and more specialized and better tagged also, I should say, so better searchable, um, we can, again, use them for whether diachronic or synchronic analysis, whether written, I had to look at the written corpus, spontaneously produced spoken language, which definitely was uh, relevant for my research. Um, better tagging, as I said, including phonic information, which definitely is only at the beginning stages. Relatively rich metadata, so we can also get uh, to 
various socio cultural variables that will help us aha so the change may be was more associated with this social group rather than that social group um, and then we also have some uh, specialized corpora that could be purely diachronic they are not always huge and then various longitudinal uh, uh, acquisitional uh, uh, corpora now i know that i'm gonna just skip it um, because that's less relevant for truly historical analysis when we work with really historical data as opposed to diachronic more recent that we can actually capture. So I only want to say these few things uh, as the last words. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there really is no clear cut and useful, I should say, division between diachronic and synchronic focus. Okay, because the basic issues are always the same, variability and change, but we focus more on one or the other. And so it seems that it's not a bad idea to aim um, for a model that kind of gives us a single conceptual and analytic apparatus for applying to both of those uh, types of analysis. Now, the challenge for specifically construction grammar, but I think for any theoretical approach is to develop representational tools that really can capture the dynamic nature of, uh, of, of grammatical organization, which includes also the network models uh, that reflect variability and then the shifting uh, relationships. Now, the challenge for diachronic analyses, from my perspective, is that uh, there should be, to the extent that it's possible, uh, maybe more focus on the cognitive and social grounding of language change because that is clearly where a lot of things are happening uh, so that we can then say okay we have learned something about the change in speakers knowledge over time and i know this is huge and i'm gonna skip the examples because it doesn't really matter too much and thank you very much for sticking it up <laughs> whilst we're rearranging the film um, I'll ask a single question. Uh, can you say a little bit more about how you work out the pragmatics and it, what data do you need? What, what are the limitations? What would be ideal? Yeah, that's uh, a very good question and totally legitimate. Um, and I should say I kind of learned as I went along because construction grammar doesn't really tell you much how to do these things. Uh, so I think that, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, but I, I think that I am sort of using the methodology of uh, conversational analysis to some degree, because what I have to do is analyze dialogues. This is a dialogic phenomenon. And what I learned is that contrary to, my to what my original belief was, it's not as important what precedes these uh, insubordinate clauses as much as what follows. In other words, the uptake from the interlocutor is what tells me, aha, so this was, this interpret, he meant this rather than that. But what I would want to add to it is that in, in a later stage, so anyways, I did this because I'm lucky to have a really good spoken uh, spontaneous corpus. So I just went through the dialogues and, and figured things out. But then in the second step, uh, when I acquired a, a, an interested phonetician, uh, we started looking at the prosody, and it turned out that some of the, not, not many, it was a few, but still some of the interpretations that I kind of got out of the, the conversation analysis were only disambiguated by the prosody. So it just told us that that is really a, a very important clue for the interlocutors because you have one form, it's just a single form. So how do you know which is which? So I would say from the spoken stuff, this is kind of the process that has worked um, reasonably well for me. The written stuff, yeah, that's much harder. Thank you once again for your presentations and the first reactions the other invited speakers. Uh, we have a few minutes. I have a short very, uh, um, reaction to the, to the presentation. It's a very general one. What do you think about the future of the field? Uh, what kind of future? Because we have a kind of, I mean, um, we have quantitative and qualitative, or quantitative versus qualitative. Uh, 
data. And then you have theory, and then you have data as well. So data theory versus data, and um, or corpora, let's say in general. Um, so is there a kind of balance, or what can you see about the future of this? This is a snap reaction um, that uh, no one has mentioned uh, visualization. I, I'm seeing it's not just uh, statistics, corporate, and all the rest of it. Can you hear it? Yeah. It, it's, it's not just corpora, sophisticated statistics. That is improving. In fact, you mentioned uh, that. But um, I, I've seen an increase in visualization. Visualization is one of the brightest things going on uh, at the moment that I'm seeing up in papers, work analyses, relationships, and the way they are visualized and manipulated. That is something quite new. Uh, I think it's going to make a difference. So that would be one thing I'd watch out for. Bright future. OK. Um, I think I would like to say that uh, corpus material will continue to be very important and the improvements in what kind of searchable corpora we have will be very helpful but with a huge caveat at least from me personally uh i'm just afraid that sometimes we slip into just doing the statistics on a corpus and it's not clear <laughs> necessarily how much we learn about a given phenomenon or the language organization in general. So I would definitely put a plug in for a, a, a good combination of the quantitative, which is important, and the qualitative analysis, because without that, we really won't get the details of what, what we are observing and what's happening. And if we are looking uh, you know, truly into the future, then from my perspective, I would expect that there will be also more interest in developing um, multimodal uh, analyses and representations because that is, at least you know, from my constructional perspective, that is really what will, again, give another dimension to us about what is it that the, the speakers know, you know about their knowledge. I understand this is not an issue for working with historical texts, but I see language change not just working on, you know, medieval stuff. It is something that is happening all around. And, you know, in 20 years from now, we'll be looking at something that um, our parents <laughs> talked about. And we hopefully will have more and more material that we can work with. So that would be my wish anyway. Um, well, I agree with um, what uh, Jonathan and Miriam said. Um, I presented, for instance, um, just a qualitative uh, um, investigation. And uh, obviously, quantitative analysis is important. But uh, uh, in my opinion, from my experience, at least for the data that I have examined, or the changes that I have examined, uh, it comes uh, afterwards. In other words, you need to have an idea that you frame starting from I wouldn't say a qualitative analysis, but it doesn't matter how many times uh, um, an element, an item occurs, uh, if you do not uh, um, perspectivize uh, the, the numbers of occurrences, while at the same time, a quantitative analysis is very important to confirm or disprove, or maybe to find uh, or put in a different perspective uh, the odd data uh, that uh, mm, you know that you don't know how to organize, and maybe then in that case the quantitative analysis can, in my view, can be very useful. So a combination of uh, um, different approaches. Uh, um, um, more questions. Or comments or reactions. I don't have many minutes. So. Uh, 
Any questions or reactions or comments? Uh, I just want to thank the three of you uh, because you have given us a sense of how we can triangulate data. And also I appreciate the fact that uh, we see here the importance of both synchronic and diachronic data because uh, from synchronic data, as uh, Michaela points out, if we, can actually, um, if we can actually look at the data and see a picture, see we can actually get an account of changes that happen because basically what we are talking about is a story of language change, right? And if we see the data and can, can if we can interpret it and, and get that story of what happens, I think both of, all three of you actually have shown us something very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay. We don't have much time, so but we have time for one fast question or comment. quite late, the buses are leaving. You think that they are leaving without you. We have said uh, to wait for you, so, okay, we have people there stopping the buses. Uh, you can ask your questions or express your comments without fear about the buses. Okay, but, okay. Uh, I would like to thank you very much. All of us would like to thank you very much. Um, we meet Actually, there's a city walk now, and we meet tomorrow at 8.30.